wondering, Kara, you had been in Taiwan during the 80s, right? Yeah. Um, you lived there kind of during their transition from an authoritarian state, essentially, under the KMT to this, like, democracy. You know, looking back, do you have – what was your experience like there, and, and what do you think about – um, how Taiwan has evolved today. And what lessons China could learn from that. Sure, sure. Well, Taiwan, I was there, in, I went there first in 1988, which was a year after martial law was lifted. Um, you could still see a you know military presence around bridges and other sensitive uh, areas. I remember you had these sort of uh, uh, big character posters, you know, uh, fight communism will prevail. Uh, outside the presidential building in Taipei, uh, recapture the mainland. Uh, so in many ways, there was still a lot of the, um, uh, I guess, hangover from the martial law uh, period. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I think certainly the a, a realistic appraisal or a, an objective appraisal of Taiwan during that martial law period has to take into account the white terror um, and uh, that people were, it was an authoritarian regime. On the other hand, you did have things such as you had freedom of religion, you had basically a free economy. And one thing that is important to keep in mind, you know, when you evaluate people like uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingguo, his, his, uh, his son, um, they did keep Taiwan free from communism, which allowed the democracy to eventually uh, evolve to the vibrant democracy that it, that it is today. Uh, in some ways, and if you look at the, the Constitution of the Republic of China, um, which I think it was the 1947 Constitution, which uh, had certain Confucian elements. You know, so, for example, Taiwan, unlike our three branches of government, they have five branches, you know, the executive, legislative, and, and judicial like we have, but they also have what's called a control yen and a, um, an examination yen. And that was supposed to replicate the role of the Confucian bureaucracy that um, served as sort of an ombudsman, that was the control yen function, but also held examinations to select uh, a, a meritocratic uh, bureaucracy, uh, bureaucratic class, so that people would be governed by people that um, that were bureaucratic, and it served as a check on the emperor's power traditionally. So that 1947, I think it was 1947, uh, constitution was kind of after the uh, communists uh, took over the mainland, and Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists retreated to Taiwan. It was kind of frozen in time, and it was only after martial law was lifted. And you began to see true democratic elections and, and uh, reforms under the Constitution that that promise of, uh, of democracy and constitutional government, republicanism, uh, it, it came to uh, uh, really came into, into fruition. And again, that's an example uh, for, um, for the mainland. As long as you have Taiwan and you show that a Chinese people can be um, you know, uh, self-governing and elect their own their own leaders. That's a challenge to the Chinese Communist Party. That's a challenge to uh, uh, to Xi Jinping and uh, you know all the other members of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, that that uh, and especially that core elite there of the hundred families or or, or so um, that comprise the leadership of the uh, of the the CCP. Plus, Taiwan's democracy gave us. Bubble tea pizza. That's something that Islamism <laughs> and China never gave us. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm very curious about um, how, like, how the China Commission gets things done in particular, because I know you talk a lot about human rights in China, yeah. which in some ways is something you can't really influence tremendously. And then you also have uh, on the U.S. side, you have to deal with Wall Street and how, how do you rein them in? So, you know, while the China Commission is a commission and it's comprised of members of the Senate, members of the House, and also members of the administration, we have three commissioners from the State Department, one from the Department of Labor, and one from the Department of Commerce. Even though we don't have uh, the um, uh, authority to mark up legislation, one advantage that we do have is that the commissioners and ranking members are 
uh, comprised of members of the House from both parties and members of the Senate from both parties. Given that, and you know, go back to your schoolhouse rock, how do you get a bill uh, passed and signed into law? You need both houses of Congress. The fact that we have uh, members from both uh, sides, uh, uh, both um, sides of the aisle, but also both chambers, gives us an advantage. So that when the, uh, I mentioned the Weaver Force Labor Prevention Act, um, because of that collaboration that already exists because of our structure between House and Senate, um, that bill was passed into law. We actually have another bill now, uh, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices Act, that's going to be marked up uh, before the Foreign Affairs Committee next week. That, again, is a Four Corners uh, product. It's Mr. Smith uh, in the uh, uh, Congressman Smith in, in the House, joined by Congressman Jim McGovern, the chairman and ranking member on the House side. On the Senate side, uh, it is Senator uh, Rubio and Senator Merkley's uh, bill. Um, the House bill is going to be the, the, the one that, that advances. Um, it, it is, uh, I, I'm fairly confident, let me just tell you what the bill does. Uh, Hong Kong has three economic and trade offices. They're not embassies because it's, it's not a, a, a sovereign nation. But back when we thought that Hong Kong would be autonomous, it'd be, have its, own system in place for 50 years, as was promised uh, during the, the, the handover, Hong Kong was allowed these economic and trade offices. As democracy has been squelched in, in Hong Kong, and it's become apparent that Hong Kong no longer has that uh, promised uh, freedom of, of movement or, or autonomy, and the government's become uh, repressive uh, there, it's clear that, that Hong Kong, these Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices are just adjuncts, really, of the their outposts of the PRC, and they've been implicated in the harassment of uh, of dissidents of Hong Kong dissidents here in the United States. Um, just digress for a second. At APEC, this is something also that we're taking a close look at. There were protesters, pro democracy protesters from Hong Kong, from Tibet, Uyghurs that were harassed. Also, Chinese mainland dissidents, and and uh, they were beaten up by these pro-China uh, counter demonstrators, so almost Antifa-like uh, people. The San Francisco police stood by and did nothing. In fact, there was one. The one person who was arrested was a pro-democracy uh, dissident who was himself beaten up. Um, so that's something I think that we really need to 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 to, to look at the the harassment of people, but. Well, so that was that the Hong Kong like office that facilitated this? Uh, no, I don't want to uh, uh, say that. There have been other incidents where Hong Kong uh, dissidents, such as Anna Kwok, uh, have been harassed. If you, we did a hearing last May, which looks at uh, at um, uh, at Hong Kong and the erosion of rule of law in Hong Kong. And uh, I think if you read the testimony there of, of uh, um, Hong Kong dissidents who, who testified, you'll, you can read about the role that uh, these economic and trade offices have played in harassment. Now, there have been allegations that some of these counter protesters that beat up the pro democracy uh, protesters were, um, there was some coordination with the uh, you know, Chinese consulate there. I don't think we can necessarily go that far yet, but it's something I think that needs uh, that Congress needs to look at and uh, the administration as well. Um, this idea of, of transnational repression, you know, you read about the Chinese police stations. In fact, uh, it was in, in uh, July, uh, we had a, a hearing on transnational repression. Um, that's something that's, that's very, very real. Uh, dissidents are harassed. Um, there is the credible allegations that probably the most important Chinese dissident here in the U.S., Wei Jingsheng, that there have been at least two attempts on his life. Uh, there was an incident last in May of 2022 uh, where he was driving outside of Washington, D.C., and a car came uh, mm-hmm. and cut him off, and another car came over from behind and tried to push him off the, uh, off the road. Um, I think Newsweek reported that as well. So we have activities by uh, uh, Chinese agents uh, here in in the U.S. Even 
that really needs to bear closer scrutiny. If you talk to Uyghur human rights activists, they'll say that they're um, they're harassed. Often, the the intimidation, however, occurs because they have relatives in China, and you know they get these messages that unless you um, tone down your activism, for example, um, yeah, things will happen to your uh, to your relatives. Um, uh, and you know, there, there's there there are, uh, and, and again, I don't want to go too far out there, but these are are allegations, and they deserve closer closer scrutiny. So the the Hong Kong Trade and Economic Offices, this bill um, that's being worked on in Congress, um, what is the what is the bill? So, so, to so basically, it would authorize the president to shut down these um, uh, these outposts, really, of the PRC. Uh, because the what had been hoped for at the time that Hong Kong would retain a degree of autonomy, uh, and again could be a, a pull factor away from the center. Uh, what we've seen with what's happened just in the past five years, democracy has been squelched in 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 uh, in, in Hong Kong. Um, you have uh, o- over a thousand people who have been arrested in Hong Kong, mostly young people, 70% young people, for demonstrating and for democracy activism. That's an incarceration rate that's sort of on par with countries like Burma, Belarus, um, Iran probably uh, as as well. Um, You've seen the judiciary, which uh, has, it still has the pomp and ceremony. It still has the, uh, the wigs and the, uh, the robes of the, that they inherited from the British, but, but basically it's rubber stamping these convictions based on this national security law that was, uh, imposed at the, you know, at the directives of Beijing, uh, in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, you're seeing, uh, freedom of religion also, uh, undermined there in, in Hong Kong. Uh, control of the school curriculum, including uh, Catholic schools, uh, too, which in Hong Kong traditionally played an outside role uh, there. In fact, if it's what's interesting, sort of as a side note, a lot of the debates in Hong Kong between the pro-government and the pro-democracy people are debate, debates among Catholics on, on both sides. Um, are obviously, Cardinal Zen, who's been the spiritual head of, of uh, sort of the uh, principled re- resistance to these government dictates. Jimmy Lai, who's in in prison, a, a, a uh, Catholic, uh, Martin Lee, um, uh, Anson Chan. You've you've uh, on, on, on the other side, you know John Lee, the president, the the, the the current uh, head of the Hong Kong government, who was banned from coming to APEC, uh, also uh, Catholic. So, in some ways, it's it's interesting, and that's. Uh, in part, the role that Catholic schools played in, in Hong Kong, but now you see the, uh, you know, according to Cardinal Zen, who first noticed it, I think back in 2012, there was this encroachment upon the uh, upon the curriculum there. So we're really seeing a multi-layered uh, attack on all avenues of of, uh, of independent thought in in Hong Kong, and that's something that should be very much uh, of of concern. Thank you.